this is going to be an overview of the book of Joshua. And this is an incredible book. If you like things that are action-packed, then you're going to love the book of Joshua. You're going to love to read this book. Joshua is a manly man's man. Notice the men in the Bible who God uses are not sissies. They're always manly, tough, ready for war. And Joshua is a man of war. In 1 Timothy 1.18, it says, This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. And then in 2 Timothy 2, 3 through 4, it says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. So, if you're a born-again believer, you need to be a soldier, and you can learn from Joshua and the book of Joshua about some things in spiritual warfare. Joshua is also an amazing illustration of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the name Joshua actually even means Jesus. And if you notice in Acts 7.45, it replaces Joshua's name with Jesus' name. That's the Holy Spirit's way of further confirming the picture that Joshua shows us the Lord Jesus Christ. In Acts 7.45, it says, Which also our fathers that came after brought in with Jesus into the possession of the Gentiles, whom God drove out before the face of our fathers into the days of David. So notice it calls Joshua Jesus. Notice in the first two verses of the book of Joshua how it shows you the Lord Jesus Christ. And keep in mind that Moses shows you the law. In Joshua 1, 1, verse 2, it says, Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan thou and all this people unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. So whereas Moses didn't get them into the land, Joshua did. Moses died, but Joshua gets them over the Jordan. The same way Jesus takes you further than the law. Moses is a type of the law. He didn't get them into the land. But Jesus is different. In John 1, 17, it says, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. So the law shows you that you're a sinner, but it's Jesus Christ that leads you into the promised land of a victorious Christian life. And the author of this book is Joshua. And Samuel also writes a tad bit at the end after Joshua dies. And historically, this book shows us what happens when Israel crosses Jordan. Doctrinally, it shows us Joshua as a picture of Jesus Christ going to war at the second coming. And you'll notice the battles remind you of when Jesus Christ comes back in a vengeance. Practically, for us, this book shows us the warfare of the believer. The book of Joshua is the militant side of Christianity, which is missing today. And we don't have wars with the, a sword. We have wars with the Word of God. We don't have many today who know how to use the Word of God, which is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, according to Hebrews 4.12. But while Joshua fought physical battles with physical weapons, we fight a spiritual battle with a spiritual weapon. And as I said, Joshua replaces Moses as Jesus replaced the law. In chapters 1 through 5, you have Israel going into the land. In chapters 6 through 12, you have the battles listed for keeping the land. In chapters 13 through 24, these are primarily about the colonization of the land. So now with that quick outline, let's go through and look at the chapter Look at the book chapter by chapter and see some outstanding stories and truths. But in the first chapter, you have the commission and command of Joshua. The Lord says no one shall be able to stand before Joshua all the days of his life. So Joshua was already a tough character. But imagine God saying, 
such a thing to a person who is already a mighty man in the Lord. He wouldn't fear any man but God. We also see that Joshua is guided by a book, like we should be. In Joshua 1.8, it says, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest deserve to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then shalt thou have good success. So all your rules, comfort, guidance, help, authority, all of that is laid out for you in the King James Bible. Going into chapter 2, you are introduced to a woman named Rahab the harlot who lives in Jericho. And since she hid Israel's spies, she is told by them to let down a scarlet thread from her window so that when Israel comes through to take over Jericho, everyone in her house would be spared. In Joshua 2, 18 through 19, it says, Behold, when we come into the land, thou shalt bind this line of scarlet thread in the window which thou didst let us down by, and thou shalt bring thy father and thy mother and thy brethren and all thy father's household home unto thee. And it shall be that whosoever shall go out of the doors of thy house into the street, his blood shall be upon his head, and we will be guiltless. And whosoever shall be with thee in the house, his blood shall be on our head if any hand be upon him. So you see this scarlet thread shows us the Lord Jesus Christ. As long as we have the blood of Jesus Christ, then we're safe from the wrath of God, just like these people in Rahab's household would be safe from Israel as long as they stayed in her house and had that scarlet thread hanging down out of the window. But then in chapter 3, you have the crossing of Jordan, and this is an incredible miracle. Just as amazing as Moses parting the Red Sea. Nothing is impossible with God. If he could put Israel through large bodies of water on dry ground, then he can help you with the minor things of your everyday life. And in chapter 5, you have the new generation of Israel that were able to go into the land, and they are circumcised. So Israel is circumcised a second time. So this picture something in our salvation. When you get saved, the Lord circumcises your flesh from your soul. That's the first circumcision. And then the second one has to do with the mortification of the flesh. And that's what that picture is there in the book of Joshua. That second circumcision, when it comes to you and your salvation, is in Colossians 3, 5, where it says, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, and cleanness, and ordinate affection, evil concupiscence, covetousness, which is idolatry. So if you do this, then you will be separate and have your flesh under subjection. Then in chapter 6, you have the seven priests bearing seven trumpets of ram's horns. And this pictures the seven trumpets in the tribulation. And something to note is that Joshua is the sixth book of the Bible. And here we are in chapter 6. So that's 6-6. Six, six. And before we get to verse 6, which would make 6-6-6 six, 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 like the mark of the beast, look at verse 5. In verse 5, before you get to the 6-6-6, six, 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 it says, And it shall come to pass that when they shall make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city shall fall down flat, and the people shall ascend up, every man straight before him. So here you have people that are going to hear a trumpet, and then ascend up when they hear the trumpet. And this is in here before the sixth verse. This is Joshua, the sixth book of the Bible, and the sixth chapter in verse 5, before the sixth verse. Before the 666, you have people ascending up. Now listen, here in Joshua, the sixth book of the Bible... In chapter 6, before the 6th verse, you have it mentioning people ascending up at the sound of a trumpet before the 666. And then look what happens in verse 6. You have seven trumpets, just like the tribulation time period. Look at verse 6 in Joshua 6. It says, And Joshua the son of Nun called the priests and said unto them, Take up the ark of the covenant, and let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord. So just here in the book of Joshua, you have an outline for the rapture taking place before the mark of the beast and seven trumpets. And of course, we don't base our doctrine off of this. We base it off clear things in the Bible. But that's just neat that it shows us a picture of the rapture taking place 
before the 666 and before seven trumpets. So moving on in chapter 7, Israel is defeated at Ai because someone in the camp was sinning, showing how sin will cause you to lose victory in your Christian life. Achan sinned when he took the goodly Babylonian garment. He saw it, he coveted it, and he took it. And he ends up stoned and burned. That's why they say if you play with sin, you're going to get burned. In chapter 8, you have Israel coming back and defeating Ai, showing just because a certain giant or sin or obstacle defeated you to begin with, this doesn't mean you can't go back and get the victory. And it's a great story how Joshua and Israel uses deception to defeat Ai. In Joshua 8.13... Starting there, it says, And when they had set the people, even all the host that was on the north of the city, and their liars in wait on the west of the city, Joshua went that night into the midst of the valley. And it came to pass, when the king of Ai saw it, that they hasted and rose up early. And the men of the city went out against Israel to battle, he and all his people, at a time appointed, before the plain. But he wist not that there were liars in ambush against him behind the city. And Joshua and all Israel made as if they were beaten before them, and fled by the way of the wilderness. And all the people that were in Ai were called together to pursue after them. And they pursued after Joshua, and were drawn away from the city. And there was not a man left in Ai or Bethel, that went not out after Israel, and they left the city open, and pursued after Israel. And the Lord said unto Joshua, Stretch out the spear that is in thy hand toward Ai, for I will give it into thine hand. And Joshua stretched out the spear that he had in his hand toward the city, and the ambush quit, arose quickly out of their place, and they ran as soon as he had stretched out his hand. And they entered into the city and took it and hasted and set the city on fire. And when the men of Ai looked behind them, they saw, and behold, the smoke of the city ascended up to heaven. And they had no power to flee this way or that way, and the people that fled to the wilderness turned back upon their pursuers. And when Joshua and all Israel saw that the ambush had taken the city and that the smoke of the city ascended, then they turned again and slew the men of Ai. So what an incredible story about how Joshua and Israel deceived the people of Ai and ambushed them. So you read in chapter 9, verse 1 and 2, it says, And it came to pass when all the kings which were on this side Jordan in the hills and in the valleys and in all the coasts of the great sea over against Lebanon, the Hittite, and the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Perizzite, the Havite, and the Jebusite, heard thereof that they gathered themselves together to fight with Joshua and with Israel with one accord. So you know what happens at the second coming? The nations gather together against their enemy, the Lord Jesus Christ, just like they're gathering together here to fight with Joshua, a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. Revelation sixteen fourteen through 16 says, For they are the spirits of devils working mir miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. So they gather together against their enemy, the Lord Jesus Christ, at the second coming, just like you have people gathering together against Joshua and Israel. So men gather together, even though they are enemies, just for the reason that they hate Jesus Christ, just like the Pharisees did with the Sadducees. Then in chapter 9, you also have the part where the Gibeonites deceive Israel. They pretend to be from a far-off place when they are just their neighbor, and they get Joshua and Israel to make a covenant with them, even though Israel wasn't supposed to. So this goes to show that even a good man can be deceived and not just lost people. Why do you think Paul says over and over again in his epistles to the church the phrase, Be not deceived. Be not ignorant. Be not deceived. Let no man deceive you. Over and over again. And then in chapter 10, you have the great miracle of the sun standing still. Not only this, but the Lord also drops hailstones on the enemies of Israel. Joshua 10, 11 through 14 says, And it came to pass as they fled from before Israel and were in the going down in Bethlehem, that the Lord cast down great stones from heaven upon them unto Azekah, and they died, and they were more which died with hailstones than they whom the children of Israel slew with the sword. 
Then spake Joshua to the Lord in that day, in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand thou still upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of Ajalon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed, until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is this not written? Is not this written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven, and hasted not to go down about a whole day, and there was no day like like that before it or after it, that the Lord hearkened unto the voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel. So this is what it's going to be like at the second coming. The Lord will fight for Israel. In Romans eleven twenty six through 27, it says, And so all Israel shall be saved, that is, as it is written, There shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. So, looking back at the book of Joshua in chapter 11, we read more about Israel's dominance over the enemy because of the Lord's help. In Joshua 11, 1 through 5, and you know, read verses 18 and 19, you'll see how it's the Lord that takes care of Israel. It's not because Israel is is so great and grand that they're able to defeat all these enemies. It's because the Lord is with them. And I just love reading about a dominant group of soldiers. That is a common plot in movies. Underdog stories are some of the most common movie plots. And Israel was going against bigger and mightier men who outnumbered them. And they were winning not because... They were great, but because the Lord was fighting for them. And in chapter number 12, you have a list of all the soldiers who were defeated by Moses. All the soldiers and kings defeated by Moses and Joshua. And I think that's just interesting. They have this saying that if you want to be the best, then you have to beat the best. And Israel beat everybody. If Israel had a basketball team and the opposing team had Michael Jordan at shooting guard, Magic Johnson at point guard... LeBron James at the small forward spot, Tim Duncan at power forward, Shaq at center, and in their prime with Kobe and Larry Bird and Wilt Chamberlain coming off the bench, then Israel would beat them because it is the Lord that was helping them win. In Romans 8.31, it says, What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? In chapter 13 and 14, it talks about a land that's still to be conquered and it talks about some inheritances in chapters 15 through 19 you have the co-signment of land to the 12 tribes chapter 20 goes into the cities of refuge chapter 21 talks about cities given to the levites and chapters 23 and 24 you have joshua's last messages to israel and his death so i don't want to give all of it away in case you haven't read the book yet, I don't want to give any spoilers. But just go through this book, read it, highlight all the amazing stories. Try to figure out how you can apply them to yourself today for your spiritual warfare. Think about the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ as you read this book. You're going to see so many similarities between Joshua and the Lord Jesus Christ. And just notice how that Joshua is probably even a more mighty soldier than David. Joshua, when he seen the angel of the Lord, he and he didn't know if it was the enemy or if it was one of his friends. You know, he wasn't afraid of the angel of the Lord, whereas David was. You know, Joshua was a tough character, and he had already been told by God that no man would be able to stand before him. So imagine the boldness and confidence that Joshua had because he knew he was on the side of truth, the side of God. Just like today, if you have the truth, if you know you have the right Bible, the King James Bible, and you know you're saved, you should be able to, to be bold in the truth and stand for anything. But this has been the book of Joshua.